What's up, everybody? Man, today we conclude a two-month series that we titled Love Overcomes. Did you like the new little intro? Did you notice the three of you that noticed we uh, made a couple of adjustments there? Mostly just made it pink. Uh, But we are super glad that you're here today, and we just pray that even if you haven't been here for two months and haven't heard this entire series, really, uh, it was very intentional. In February, we talked about recognizing and experiencing and understanding God's love, which we're going to talk about here in a few moments. And then mostly this month, we've talked about if we can really experience God's love, now we can give it away. Well, today I really want to talk about his resurrection life, but why we have the resurrection life of Jesus and what was motivating God to send Jesus his son. A lot of us know the story of Easter and know the story of the resurrection Sunday that we celebrate today, but not all of us remember why. Not all of us understand or remember why it matters. So I'm praying that today uh, we recognize why it matters and why the resurrection life and his power and his spirit makes a difference in our lives now, today, thousands of years later. Amen? Um, Let's pray. Father, I pray for those of us here in the room and watching online, I pray, God, that your spirit would be here. Minister to us. Speak to us, God. Help us to recognize and know and experience your love today. Help us, God, to see your powerful love that overcomes and is victorious and uh, conquers and never fades and never fails. God, we pray that you would be honored and celebrated here in every single person's life, every person watching online. In the name of Jesus, everybody say out loud, amen. Amen. Say it again, say amen. Amen. Some of you have already asked, now, why, uh, what were all these, these, uh, these pieces of paper on the cross? Friday night, we had what we call a Good Friday service, and uh, boy, it was super fantastic, and we just really pre- appreciate Pastor Rick for preaching the word and the music and everything. But uh, yeah, give him a good hand clap. Praise the Lord. Uh, a handful of people gave their life to Christ that night, but we took a, a moment to put names on the cross, uh, each, each individual. There was over 200 people that were here Friday night, and we just took a while. I thought it'd take about five or 10 minutes. It took like 20 minutes, but we just took time to nail people's names on the cross. These are real people with real stories that we are praying for as the body of Christ. And I just want to invite all of you, if you want to here today at the end of the service, uh, we'll try to find some paper. And uh, if you want to have some prayer requests of some people in your life that you would like prayer for, we as a staff and as a church are going to continue to pray for these names. And so we're just praying that God's will is being done in their lives as well. So I just wanted to clarify because this symbol of the cross uh, is so crucial and important to this story. When we talk about the love of God, and you all know, for God so loved the world that he would send his son. And as Pastor Rick said, God came not to live. God came to die. And that separates us from different anyone else. So when Jesus came here on this earth, his mission ended here on the cross, so we thought. But uh, that's for coming up here in, the rest, in just a moment to hear the rest of the story. Here, let me dive into the love of Jesus, a love that overcomes. First John chapter 3 and verse 16. By this we know, or come to know, or progressively recognize, and I love that that's the idea that we're growing, we're moving forward in God's love, to perceive and to understand the essential love. Some translation says real love, that this is real love. Uh, that he laid down his life for us. Real love, church, is Jesus on the cross. According to scripture, this is what real love is. Is Jesus going to the cross and dying for us, taking on the sin of all mankind, dying a death, a final sacrifice for us. It's important for us to remember this because we're going to talk about his resurrection life in just a moment. But he couldn't have resurrected. He couldn't have conquered death in the grave if he didn't go to the cross and die for our sins. And if he didn't take on the weight of the world. And it was God's love that was motivating him. It was God's love, not because he was just so loving, but his love for you. His love for you. All mankind, but that means you. God loves you. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you. 
you old stinking sinner. Don't say that part, but just say God loves you. John 13 says he loved them with a continuous and continuously loves them with his perfect love, eternal love. One translation says to show the, the endless measure, the full measure of his love. God is trying to get his love to you, his connection to you, his, his uh, acceptance of you, displaying that he values you and wants you. And there is no greater way than to send his son to die a sinner's death, sacrifice his life. God sacrificing on the cross so that he could have eternal life with you. Not only so you could have eternal life, but that he would have eternal relationship with every single one. All mankind. God wishes that all people would be saved. He wants all people to have relationship and to have a saving knowledge of him. That's the love of God. That's the passion of Christ. And even when we don't reciprocate his love, he still loves us. Even when we sin and forget and make mistakes and fail, like we all do every single day, it doesn't affect his love for us, his value for us. That's an important key because many of us have been taught by grandma whoever or aunt whoever or uncle whatever or pastor whatever we could watch television we saw some hollywood show of what it was like to be a christian and we miss out on the love of jesus we get caught up in all of our behaviors and all of the ways that we should live and 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 behave here on this earth and we miss out god cares about that only for your life on earth to be more holy and to be more righteous and to live in his abundant life but mainly he wants you he's not looking at all of our our, our sin and our destruction jesus paid all of that ahead of time so he loves us cares for us values us wants us in fact romans or, uh, the book of romans paul one of the apostles after jesus had died after he had been raised from the dead paul goes out and he is helping build the church, the New Testament church, the New Covenant church that we celebrate here today. And in Romans chapter 8, this is how he described Jesus' love. He said, who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one, Jesus? He said, absolutely no, no one. In other words, that was a rhetorical question. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. And maybe you need to hear that as love towards you. Troubles, pressures, problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. That's what, per, what about persecutions, deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No, for they're all important to hinder, um, uh, they're, for they're all impotent to hinder omnipotent love. Come on, his, his love has no end. It's all powerful. Jump to verse 37. Yet even in the midst of all these things, we triumph over them all. We triumph. We are victorious. Or as the title says to this series, love overcomes. Why do we say love overcomes? Because Christ overcame, motivated by love. We're victorious over everything. Verse 38. So now live with the confidence that there's nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels, dark rulers in the heavens. And there's nothing in them in our present or future circumstances that can weaken his love. Verse 39, there's no power above or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the, in the universe that could distance us from God's passionate love which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus, the anointed one. He said, wait a minute, Pastor Frank, I thought this was about the resurrection life of God. Yeah, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but you've got to understand why. Let's understand what motivated God to love us, to die on the cross, to be resurrected to send the Holy Spirit and we can have the presence and the power of God in us, how we can pray and sing songs and live this abundant life. Jesus came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. But we got to know why. It's because he loved us and he wants to continually, eternally lavish his love upon us. That's, that's, a, that's a big concept to comprehend. That's why we took all of, all of February to talk about it. And then I thought we would move on in in this month in March. And basically half the month, we've still been talking about getting God's love in us, trying to fathom God's love for us. In 1 John chapter 4, John, the disciple, he's, he's trying to help us here, trying to describe this infinite love, church, 
this unfailing love, this never fading love, this uh, omnipresent love, this boundless love. He says, we've come into an in- intimate experience with God's love. And we trust in the love that he has for us. And God is love. Now, if we don't understand what that means, we're just like, oh, that's just a statement. Like, Nike's just do it. Or McDonald's, I'm here for it. Or whatever his, her, that phrase is. Yeah, some of you are laughing because you know McDonald's, all right, a little bit too much. But those who are living in love, I'm sorry, I shouldn't insult people on Easter. Those who are living in love, come back next week and you'll get a full dose. Those who are living in love are living in God and God lives through them. Verse 17, by living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. All that Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now, the only way that that can happen is because he's motivated by love. He's stirred up by love. And now we can celebrate the resurrection. He didn't die on the cross and it was just over. We told people on Friday night as we dismissed and we're like, come back Sunday. The story's not over. So we're here to celebrate the rest of the story. We're here to celebrate the resurrection power of God, the life of God. But let's not forget why we celebrate. And yes, there is power. He conquered death and we have eternal life. But he did it because he loves us and he values us and he wants us. The devil has no power over us. I mean, you think about it. The devil has no power over me. What's the devil going to do to me when I have the king of the world, the, the savior of the world, the God of the universe living and dwelling and thinking about me? His thoughts towards me are, are, are good, are kind. He didn't come to condemn the world. He came to the world that we would be saved, all motivated by love, his love for us. Bring it on, devil. Can't hurt me. Can't. Oh, in this earth, I can have sickness. I can have discouragement. I can have struggles. And so, but when I'm, I'm thinking big, I'm thinking long term, man, the presence and the power of God, God's thoughts towards us are loving all the time. God unconditionally loves you with all that he is and all that he has. He's his thoughts on you. He thinks good. Let's let that, let that settle for just a quick second. Because we know God loves us, we can have confidence. Because we know he wants the best for us, we can have peace and we can have trust. Because we know God loves us, he's not trying to bring harm. He's not trying to bring sickness. He's not pr- trying to bring conflict and destruction. He's not bringing all that negativity to teach you something. He's not bringing any evil on the world. That thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus came to bring life. And it's all motivated by his love. That's a big concept for us. That's a big uh, shift for some of us to realize God's thinking about you lovingly. Always. All the time. He doesn't see our, our mistakes and our bad behavior and go, oh boy. Go get it together and then you can get, when you get it all together, come back to me. Many of us feel that way. When I talk to people, a lot of times and invite them to church or invite them into a relationship with God, especially the church, they're like, ah, no, I'm not coming there. I walk in that place and it's going to catch on fire. The lightning's going to strike. I ain't, you're not that bad. You you think you're all that, but you ain't. Uh, God's love is way bigger than your sin. God's love is way bigger than your failures and your mistakes. God conquered it all on the cross. Uh, Listen to this in Romans chapter 5. We know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love. Everybody say his great love. Yeah. For us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, you didn't have to get it all together. And then Christ decided to love you. Verse nine, since we've been made right in God's sight, we've been made right in God's sight. You are, you're now right. You were wrong, but now you're right. 
You were left, but now you're right. Okay, that one, not political. I just meant, never mind. Uh, Verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of his, of Christ, he'll certainly save us from God's condemnation. Verse 10. And since our friendship, I want to sit on this word friendship for a moment. Since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. See, you have this opportunity to be saved by the life of his son. Now, he was here living, then he died on the cross, and he was resurrected to new life, and now God wants to call us friend. We have an opportunity to be friends with God. Look at the last scripture, verse 11, and now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship, a relationship with God, because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Did you hear that online? I hope some of you online were amening and typing in, preach it, preach it, because there was nothing here in the room. It was quiet. Yeah. Uh, But did you catch that? God wants to have relationship with you, friendship with you. And it wasn't like, he's God. He could have gone and made us friends, but he didn't. He wants us to willingly surrender our lives to him and accept and believe in him, trust in him. And now he calls us friend, relationship, friendship with God. It's only because of what him, he am going to the cross, being raised from the dead. And now he says, let's be friends. And it's all motivated because of his love. Now watch We all have people in our life that we love and we have to love. Uh, Thank you. Most people caught that. Uh, But not all of us have those same people and we like them. We all have relatives. I mean, we love them, but we don't like them. We don't want to be friends. We're not like, like once or twice a year at a holiday or a birthday. We're like, we're good. That was enough of them right? We have co-workers that, you know, Bible tells us we have to love one another. So I love them, but boy, I don't want to be friends. God knows all of our funkiness. God knows all of our sin and our behavior. You think you're judging those people? What do you think God knows about us? What do you think God has on you? And he says, I want to be your friend. He not only loves us, he likes us. He likes you. He wants to be with you. Now think about it. God likes you. Think about how much he loves you. And that's kind of uh, unimaginable. But when we start thinking God likes you and wants to be your friend, like, whew, who can fathom that? Now, with this idea of love, this idea that this is the motivation, he's out to get you, <laughs> but not in a condemning, judgmental way to show you demonstrate his love. And he said, like, what else can I do? I'm going to send my son, send him to the cross, be beaten, taken on all the sin of the world, so much that God the Father turned his eyes and looked away, and and Christ is hanging on the cross saying, God, you forsake, why? Where are you? And he just had to get all of the evil away. And God, God the Son took it all on him and died a sinner's death for you and I. But now, the story's not over. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Today, we remember, we remember that we are not a problem. Today, we remember that you were not a burden to God. He selflessly gave his son, Jesus. Today, we're going to remember to know that Jesus was content to come and die for you and I. That you're not a problem. You're not a bummer to him. And I, as I said earlier, when God thinks about you, not just you, the world, but when you, when he thinks of you, he does so lovingly. So in Matthew chapter 28, let's start at verse one. Early Sunday morning, the new day was dawning and Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to the tomb. A couple of ladies going out to the tomb. They had just seen their savior, Jesus, die on the cross And suddenly there was a great earthquake. I wonder if it was like on their way and they're like, whoa, what's happening? They're on their way to the tomb. And they sense this earthquake happening. 
And an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Now, an, an angel. Be careful of your image of an angel. Some of us think Hallmark angels. And they're like little pudgy little angels with little wings or a cartoon. No, no, no. Watch what happens when this angel shows up. The angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the, the stone, and sat on it. It wasn't a little pudgy angel that can do that. So verse 3, his face shone like lightning. So earthquakes and lightning and stones rolling. All right? Uh, and his clothing was as white as snow. And the guards shook with fear when they saw him. And they fell into a dead faint. Just pause for just a moment. The earth is shaking. The light is bright. A big angel shows up, rolls the stone away, and the guards see it. These are Roman soldiers with armor and helmets and weapons. And they look, the earth has been shaking, the light's so bright, they're like, whoa, I'm down. And in fact, I'm faint. In fact, I can't move. In fact, I'm out. And Jesus... Jesus is, is nowhere to be seen. He's gone. And the light comes on. The, the, the stone is rolled away. And the guards shook with fear. They fell in a dead faint. And the angel spoke to the women. Why did he speak to the women? Because the guards are fainted and dead acting. They're out. Who else is he going to talk to? Everybody else. They're gone. So he talks to the women. Looks what he says to the women. Ladies, you missed a great opportunity to say amen right there, all right? But uh, he said, ladies, don't be afraid. I know you're, why would you be afraid? Because the earth was shaking and lights and stones rolling and guards are fainting. He says, chill, it's okay. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. But that's why we came. Yeah, he's not here. Yeah, but I want to come and pay homage to him. I want to honor him. No, he's not here. Remember, that was the plan all along. He's not dead. I know you're looking for Jesus. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead. Many translations says, he is not here. He is alive. He is alive. That changed everything. Just as he said he would, as would happen. Now he says, come, see where his body was laying or was lying. See where it was lying. It is not here anymore. He ain't here. Look, look, it's empty. Just step over those bodies. Look in here. They'll be fine. Now he says, ladies, because the guys are still out. He says, ladies, go quickly. Now, now, go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. One translation says that he's risen to new life. He's risen to life. 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 The remainder of today, I just want to talk about his life. His life, how he valued life how he wants to instill his life in us, all motivated by love. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25 says, he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. Life. Because he was raised from the dead, because he loved us so much and was raised from the dead and now he's alive we are now right with God. We have the availability. We have the opportunity to be right with God by believing and receiving. Now, see, the cross, it looked like failure. It looked like, that's why the ladies are like, here, we're here to mourn. They're like, get up, go, tell his disciples. He's alive. The cross looked like failure, but the, the cross was the, the greatest act of love ever committed on this earth. It created the possibility of eternal life and abundant life for you and I. C.S. Lewis, theologian and writer, 
Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, for some of you may have seen. Uh, he wrote, he said this. He said, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. Come on, right? Jesus came to make us alive. And I just want to inspire us today and encourage us today to every day. Yes, we're walking in his love, but it should be demonstrated by there, a life in us, a, a spirit, a resurrection spirit, a resurrection power. And with that comes an enthusiasm, a, a, a rolling stones away, a light that's so bright, a, a, a death defying life of God working in us. Remember we read earlier, as Jesus is, so are we now in this world. And later we find out that Jesus said, I'm with you, but I'm sending somebody better, the Holy Spirit. He'll be in you. That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells within us. And the Bible says it quickens or makes alive our mortal bodies. That life. Come on, every day, as, you, as you're a husband and, or a wife or a mom or a dad, as you're a single person or, or going to school or at work or wherever you are, that life of God can be activated and stirred up in us. All motivated by God's love, but it's going to be demonstrated by the life of God. The life of God. Romans chapter 6, Paul said, Since we've been united with him in his death, we'll also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin. When he died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we'll also live with him. We're sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead. Jump to verse 11. You also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Jesus. Do you remember that you're alive in Jesus? Don't let sin control the way you live. Don't give in to the sinful desires. Don't let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. Now, a religious person, an old traditional person, and maybe great-grandma, whatever her name was, or maybe I should pick on great-grandpa, well, whoever he was, is all going to focus, out of all of that, they're going to focus on, don't give in to those sinful desires. Don't give in to those evil ways. Don't let your body become an instrument of sin. And they're pointing their finger and talking all mean and evil like the Pharisees. No offense to your grandma. But look at the context of what he's saying. Experience the love of God. Experience the life of God. Just as Jesus was, so can you be. Walk in that life. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives and dwells within you. So it's less about don't do and do and all the do's and don'ts. It's more about just God's love, God's life in you. And he's going to lead and direct us. Don't be focused on what not to do. Let's be focused on the love of God, the life of God, the spirit of God, the fruit, the, the manifestation of the presence of God. And all the behavior stuff will work, work itself out. Let's just keep God big in our life. Let's keep his love big in our life. Let's keep his life big in our lives. God will work out all the other stuff. We'll keep growing and become better disciples and so forth. But we're going to keep our mind on him. He's going to keep us in perfect peace. Amen. Jesus gave that life so we can experience God's life and God's love in a real way manifested in our lives. Paul said in, to the church in Ephesus in chapter 2, he said, but God is so rich in mercy. Can I put the word love there? Uh, it's mercy. Mercy means not giving you what you deserve. So he's just giving you grace. He's giving you mercy. He's giving you compassion, kindness. That's the love of God. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by grace that you've been saved, right? It's not by all your perfect behavior. Otherwise, none of us could say, oh, we're, we're saved and following Jesus and we have eternal life. No, it's because we believe this story. We trust in his love. We trust in the life of God. Verse 6, and he raised us, he raised us, he lifted us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Jesus. So good. 
Paul wrote to the church in Rome in chapter 8, in verse 10, he said, Christ lives his life in you. You catching this? I mean, I think we can miss this. We can just go, oh, and let's sing some more songs about the cross and the resurrection and so forth. But let's understand why. It's so that Christ can live his life in you. Even though your body may be dead because of the efforts of sin, his life-giving spirit imparts life to you because you're fully accepted by God. You're welcomed by God. You're valued by God. We, we just, we always want to try to create an environment here at our church, but I want you to create that in your home and in your neighborhood, in your workplace, that people in your life are accepted, whether they're following Jesus or they're voting for the people you think they should vote for, or they're, they're, they're living the lifestyle that you think they should live, that God loves them and sees past their behavior. We could learn a lot from that. God sees past their behavior and just sees them as a soul that was created in the likeness and image of him and he desires them and wants them and values them and sent his son to die on the cross for us, was raised again to new life so that Christ's power, spirit, and love could live within us. Verse 5, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only God's grace that you've been saved. And verse 6, he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we're united with Christ. Sorry, that was back in Ephesians. Media crew's going, where did he go? (laughs) Sorry, back to verse 11, Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. It's my daughter back there. She'll figure it out. Yes, God raised Jesus to life. Since God's spirit of resurrection lives in you, he'll also raise your dying body to life by the same spirit that breathes life into you. Listen how many times God talks about life. Life matters. And Jesus said, I came to bring life and to bring it more abundantly. Every day, I'm praying, God, help us to walk in your abundant life as you intended as you intended. Help us, Lord Jesus, to walk in that. I want to pray for us here today. I want to take a few moments and pray for a few things. And I want to pray for you that you would receive that life. It's motivated by love. You should be stirred by the love of God working in you. But it is the life of God that we can experience. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says, let's give thanks to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy or his great love. He gave us new life by raising Jesus from death. This fills us with living hope. I'm praying that as you hear these scriptures, if you've heard the songs, as you've heard our time of prayer and fellowship and community here, maybe just being here and seeing the cross reminds us that we can have a living hope in Jesus. God has given you his resurrection life. God has given you his resurrection power. And I'm praying that that resurrection power and life would raise up some dead relationships here today. Maybe you're watching online or some dead marriages some broken relationships with kids, maybe some death in your own body, decay in your own body, in your finances. Maybe you feel like stagnant. Stagnant is the next step to just dying and floating downstream. God wants us to be alive and moving forward every part of your life. As a parent, as a brother, as a sister, as a child to your parents, in your workplace, in your neighborhood? Are you bringing the life? God wants to stir somebody in their neighborhood. I sense that right now. God's just wanting you to bring life to your next door neighbor, to your cross the street neighbor. Where's God stirring in your heart to bring his resurrection life? Maybe you feel like your usefulness is dead. Maybe it's because of age. Maybe it's because of a, of a failure in business or a failure in relationship or your body. Go talk to Pastor, Pastor Rick about that. No, your usefulness is not dead. 
God is stirring hope in you today. God is raising up and resurrecting some dreams and visions and goals and and destiny that he's put in your heart, purposes and plans. I believe as long as you have breath, God has life for you here, now, today. And I'm praying that your best days are ahead. Let me just pray for you right now and pray that God is bringing new life and power to you. If anything's speaking to you that there's an area in your life that senses just decay and death and you need to speak life into that would you just hold up a hand i'm not going to make you talk or just but just you just pray right now god raise up your resurrection life in my business in my finances would you hold up your hand if you need resurrection life in a relationship with with your children in your neighborhood in your co-work that you can represent the life and the love of god father i pray for the people in this room and those watching online with hands raised god i'm praying for signs and wonders and miracles working in them that you are blessing people those who are empty would be filled up those who are broken would be mended those who are lost would be found God you're ministering to people here in this room just resurrecting dreams and goals and visions you're resurrecting marriages and children's lives and calling them back into the kingdom of God I pray, God, you're ministering that spiritual life and power in them right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I wrote down in Ephesians chapter 3. It'll be on the screen. Go ahead and, and you're welcome to read along with me. Or you may just want to close your eyes and listen to this. This is Paul praying to the church in Ephesus. And I'm praying for this for you here today on Easter. That in the name of Jesus, and I pray every single one of us here in the room and everyone watching online, that by constantly using your faith, that the life of Christ will be released deep inside of you. I'm praying that the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. And then you'll be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and, and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measurement that transcends our understanding. Jesus, this extravagant love pours into you until you're filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. Do you receive that here today? I pray that you would receive that blessing in the name of Jesus. Would you close your eyes and I want to pray for one other thing here today. Some of you may feel very far from God. And maybe today has just brought back this remembrance of him. And you've walked away from God. Or maybe you don't even know where you are in your walk with God. But you're feeling drawn to him today. I'm intentionally using that word that you feel compelled or drawn to him today. Romans 6 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. I want to encourage you here today, those of you who are feeling drawn to him, if you're ready to submit your life to Jesus and accept his life today, I want to pray for you to receive the new hope that Jesus' life will bring you. Or maybe you just say, Well, I'm ready to come back to you today. You've been You've given your life to Christ, but you're far from here. You feel disconnected and you want to say, okay, I'm in. Count me in. Would you dare to believe, church? Believe in God's love for you. Believe in God's life for you. Believe that Jesus died for you because he loves you and wants to have a relationship. Dare to trust in his love for eternal life. just asking everyone to be in prayer right now. I'm going to lead us in a prayer in just a moment. But if that's you to receive Jesus for the first time or to rededicate your life, would you just slip your hand up and wave it at me real quickly so I can just see it across the room? Anyone? Just let me see a hand really quickly. Anyone? Good. Good. Anyone else? Yes. Anyone else that wants to say, hey, count me in today. I want to give my life to Christ. Dedicate my life to Jesus here 
in the name of Jesus. Can I have everybody say this prayer out loud with me? If you'd like to accept Jesus, they're online as well. Come on, together, let's say this and encourage one another. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me and giving me your son, Jesus. I believe Jesus is my Lord and that he died and he rose for me. I repent of my sin and I surrender all. And now I receive your resurrection life in Jesus' name. Amen.